There we go. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, and just confirm, are you seeing my presentation mode? Yep, we are. Okay, great. Uh, thank you. And thank you everybody for coming today to talk about inclusive practices and software project productivity. As uh, David mentioned, I'm Mark Miller from Lawrence Livermore Labs. And uh, let's see, this is just an outline of what I'll talk about, uh, some introductory remarks about inclusion and bias, uh, and then talk about inclusion from a productivity standpoint. And then the bulk of the, the presentation will just focus on a, a number of concrete practices for cultivating inclusion in software projects. Uh, and uh, I, I'm guessing as I walk through them, people may uh, think of other practices that I could probably include there and would love for people to suggest them as they occur to them. I'll end with some resources. And if we have time, I have a short Kahoot game that's kind of fun to play, just kind of test people's knowledge if there's time and interest. And we'll see if we can make that work or not. So first off, why do we want to talk about inclusion? Um, and I really, really found this quote in a document I was reading recently very relevant. Talent is equally distributed across all social uh, cultural groups, but access and opportunity are not. Uh, that's from Dr. Angela Byers Winston in a 2019 report. Uh, so what is inclusion? In the context of an open source project, inclusion is about creating an environment where all individuals, regardless of, you know, fill in the blank, you know, gender, ethnicity, ableness, uh, uh, country of origin, fill in the blank there. So we're all individuals, regardless of that, feel welcomed, respected, valued, and encouraged to contribute as their full authentic selves. This involves ensuring equitable access to project resources, as well as reducing barriers to participation. So it's, it's more than just allowing participation, it's about actively cultivating and supporting contributions of all interested individuals. So uh, there's, a, there's a, a, a witticism that I, I like to share about this. If diversity means getting invited to the party, inclusion means getting asked to dance. So I will say this talk focuses on practices, but it's ultimately about people. And, and without a doubt, the highest impact practice is the practice of broadening participation by historically underrepresented populations. And, and it turns out there are a number of programs that are investing in that. For example, from NSF, the Exascale Computing Project, the last couple of years that that project was heavily involved in broadening participation. The Sustainable Horizons Institute, which I have the privilege of working with, uh, also has a broadening participation program. There's a number of these programs and they really do have the highest impact as far as inclusion goes. So I'm not gonna be talking about those programs here. I'm more talking, uh, talking about a number of other practices. And, and we might ask why, and, and my reason for that is if the culture, the workplace culture is not inclusive, then people can struggle, struggle to stay in that culture and succeed. So sort of a corollary to what I said previously, who wants to stay at a party will, where no one will dance with them? So what is anti-inclusion? So in the context of open source projects, it's the practice of differential treatment or evaluation of contributors or their contributions based on non-relevant personal attributes, such as, you know, again, you can fill in the blank. It's actions, policies, and practices that discourage or disadvantage whole groups of people from participating fully and equitably. So it turns out bias is a key enabler of anti-inclusion. I'll just go through a, a handful of examples here, examples of what I call inclusivity bugs. So this device pictured here is something used in use at Livermore Labs in classified uh, buildings, and it, it's a fail-safe mechanism. We can, we can attach a, a camera and a microphone to that device, and it will time out after 30 minutes and disconnect whatever's connected to the USB. The light on the top of the device is supposed to indicate its its state. Green is safe and, and red means it's active, it's unsafe. Um, it turns out that those two colors, uh, there's about one in 12 men and one in 200 women can actually not see the difference in those colors. So there's a bias there and that is that everyone perceives colors the same. So that represents for me what I would call an inclusivity bug. Just another example, uh, there's a new library out there for scientific computing called LibCoolKids, and it, it deals with mixed precision, for example, and it has C, C++, Python, Java interfaces to it. 
And there's a pull request to add a Fortran interface to it that's been left uh, unreviewed for lack of interest. So what's the bias there that, that Fortran is obsolete or, or not relevant? This is an example from actually the development on the Linux kernel literally within the last couple of weeks. Just a couple of weeks ago, this is an email from a, a well-known Linux developer to a colleague. And uh, these are excerpts from that email, but, uh, but I'll read it really quickly. I'm getting really fed up here. And before you start whining again about how you're fixing bugs, let me remind you, uh, I'm seriously thinking about just stopping pulling from you. If you want to have an experimental tree, you can have one outside the main line. I've told you before, and nothing seems to really make you understand. You have exactly two choices here. Play better with others or take your toy and go home. So what's the bias there? Everybody's comfortable with sort of this communication style. So those are some examples of what I'd call inclusivity bugs. So because bias is such an enabler of, of uh, anti-inclusion, it's important to focus on it a little bit. And, and I want to say the goal is really not to become bias-free. I, I, I'm, I'm sure we're all familiar with some of these refrains. You know, people will say, I treat men and, equally, men and women equally. Uh, focusing on race only divides us. I don't see color or I don't see gender. Um, the aim really cannot be for us to be bias-free. The goal is to be aware of and get control of our biases. And there's a lot of sources of bias. There's confirmation bias, affinity bias, proximity bias, implicit bias. I could list many others. And why do we want to do that? It's, that's to counteract the negative outcomes our biases often contribute to. So I try to use metaphors in trying to communicate some of these points. And, and I, I found this one about microplastics very compelling. Maybe, maybe you will as well. Um, and it's sort of what I think microplastics can teach us about unconscious or systemic bias. It turns out a lot of research recently has shown that microplastics are found everywhere in the world. They're found in human tissues and populations all over the world. In fact, there was just a, a report recently that they're even finding it in, in human brain tissue. Nobody escapes it. It's systemic. It's prolific. It's everywhere. So believing you are free of any microplastic contamination, maybe because you've never used plastics, is, is a bit naive. And if this is the first time you're learning about this, it may be uncomfortable or even creepy to hear. And it's natural to want to devoid, uh, sort of avoid or dismiss the idea. And the truth is, having to run our biases can be very uncomfortable. Uh, but, but fear not. We all have to manage biases. All of us have them. So the last thing I want to uh, mention in the introduction is the, experiencing to, uh, the experience of holding uh, to truth, because I think it's very, very relevant to discussions of this nature. Uh, so we've all seen the canonical example, is this cup half empty or half full? And, and whenever I'm talking to a science-minded audience, there's always a, a heckler in the audience that's going to say, well, Mark, you know, that, that, that cup is completely full. It's just partially filled with a liquid and partially filled with a gas. And, uh, and that is also true. But setting that sort of third truth aside, it turns out, you know, we really do have a lot of experience with holding two truths. Uh, for example, the wave uh, particle duality of light, uh, general relativity versus quantum mechanics, or even for computer science minded people, bubble sort is the worst if you think about it from a time perspective. Or bubble sorts the best if you think about it from a space uh, perspective. And finally, you know, I think I am a good person, but I can perpetuate systemic biases if I'm not careful. And the point of this is for some, what we discuss here isn't really enough to meet the moment. And for others, it may feel like it's way too much. And, and both are true. Uh, so that's it for the introduction. I'll, I, I don't, I'll pause there, uh, David. I know that you are looking at questions. I'll just pause momentarily if you, I had any questions. Yeah, none so far. Thanks. Okay. All right. So I'll move on to some results about inclusion and productivity. And first want to start with uh, sort of expanding what we understand to be the dimensions of in inclusion. So there are many film familiar dimensions to inclusion. We often see these getting a lot of the headlines, for example. But it turns out there's a lot of other dimensions to inclusion, things like neurodiversity, handedness, dyslexia. It turns out I have dyslexia, especially if I'm tired. I'm really bad with numbers if, if I'm tired. Uh, but there's a there's bottom line, there's a lot of dimensions to uh, to inclusion, uh, in addition to the familiar dimensions, which tend to get a lot of the head, headlines and tend to be where a lot of the uh, uh, work is necessary. An example, culturally relevant legal holidays is uh, is one. So for, I think back in 2020 or 2021, 
uh, Livermore Labs had the opportunity to start celebrating Juneteenth as a holiday. And that uh, I, it, it, I was happy to learn that and happy to celebrate that. And it's, it's, it's useful to know why for some, some people, especially people in the black community, the Juneteenth holiday may be more relevant, for example, than July 4th. Um, so that's just an, a dimension to inclusion. Another one that I think, you know, disability, when we think about disability, a lot of us, our minds go to people who are permanently disabled, not necessarily ourselves. But the truth is, we will all we are all likely to experience disability um, in in our day to day lives. If it's if we're dealing with situations like if you're dealing with a really noisy situation uh, at an airport, trying to participate in a meeting, then maybe closed captions will be very useful to you. In, in that context, whereas maybe for most of us, we think, well, closed captions are only useful for people who have hearing impairments. Uh, the point of uh, sort of focusing on disability is when we're inclusive for persons with any kind of disability, very likely we're being inclusive for our future selves. And it turns out that where I spend a lot of my time thinking about issues of inclusion happen to be the race, ethnicity, and gender dimensions. So some findings on inclusion and productivity. Turns out, you know, organizations with inclusive cultures are twice as likely to meet or exceed financial targets, three times as likely to be high performing, six times more likely to be innovative and agile, very relevant for soft, uh, in, in the context of software development, and eight times more likely to achieve better business outcomes. So just some more details on inclusion and how it impacts productivity. I, I won't go into all the bullets on this slide, but I'll just highlight uh, three of them. So uh, inclusion helps to uncover alternative approaches and enhances overall decision-making of the group. It makes the group more adept at identifying and addressing biases or blind spots. And finally, leads to increased uptake and adoption, uh, better user satisfaction, and ultimately a more successful product. So where does inclusion play a role in software development? And I'd say pretty much everywhere in our communications, you know, emails, chats, and so forth, the documentation we produce, presentations that we create about our software, or results obtained from them, the interfaces we design, the code we write, you know, just literally all, all aspects of uh, software development. So it turns out if you just set the people aside for a minute and think, and look at the software that we labor to produce, it turns out we already invest heavily in, in inclusion in the software itself. So for example, we support GUIs and documentation in multiple human languages. I work on the visit project and we our GUI supports uh, English, French, Spanish, and German interfaces so far. And there's people on our team that actually contribute to keeping that up to date. Uh, we value application programming and application binary interface compatibility, being able to swap one in for another, for example, in a number of our critical libraries. Uh, we design numerical libraries to handle things like a variety of different precisions, single, double, quad, even mixed precision. Uh, we want libraries that implement similar functionality to be interoperable, to interoperate with each other. Uh, we want data analysis tools to read a variety of file formats. Again, because I work on Visit, I'll use an example. We, we read, I think, now over 150 different file formats into Visit. Uh, we design libraries with a variety of interfaces, C, C++, Fortran, Java, you know, what have you, and even parallel execution paradigms. My point in mentioning all of this is we already invest heavily in making software inclusive for other pieces of software. So the question is, can we uh, invest in inclusion and in people for developing it as well? So in this section, uh, just to say that inclusivity does not come for free, but it does have a payoff in the long run. And staying on the status quo also has costs associated with it. So if you stay on the status quo, maybe you're going to be dealing with higher turnover, reduced user reach, maybe stagnated innovation, reduced talent pool, maybe even uh, dealing with compliance and legal risks. Uh, investing in inclusivity does require effort. You've got to update policies and roll them out to the people, the relevant people. There may be increased uncertainty during these times. There's training and education. Uh, and there may be even values-driven turnovers, as as you know, some people decide they don't want to they don't want to participate in those inclusive processes and practices. And there's maybe even some enforcement costs. But in the long run, once you get on that that new track, 
Uh, there are great benefits from uh, inclusive culture and, and employing inclusive practices. So I'll pause there, uh, David, to ask if there's any questions. None so far. Okay, thanks. Okay, so now we'll get into the meat of the talk. I think what mo most people came to uh, hear are practices for cultivating inclusion. And you're you just it's basically a laundry list. I, I they're not presented in any particular order. So I'll just start with uh, consider inclusive language practices and standards. Uh, the inclusive naming initiative is a good example. I was involved in that initiative a few years ago um, and haven't been uh, as uh, more recently. Uh, but there's a number of different efforts out there that that are seeking to improve language used in in the code itself and in documentation about the code and and so forth. Uh, so the inclusive naming initiative is one one of them. The uh, there are links to many others, and and Dave Dave David had already mentioned that you have access to these uh, slide decks already. The, there's plenty of links in these slide decks to the resources I'll be pointing out. Uh, one in particular I'll just uh, just mention here is the U.S. Government Plain Language Standard. It's actually quite a long standard, but the reason I like it is it kind of gets focuses on on just basically speaking plain and being uh, being clear and concise and and not using a bunch of uh, difficult to understand language. There's it turns out in in scientific computing, there's one very prolific uh, language uh, uh, challenge, a problem, and that is the use of master-slave terminology. Uh, if you go on to GitHub, you'll find literally millions of hits of this in various repos. It's it's used quite prolifically in scientific computing too. Um, and so, different software projects I've been uh, either involved in directly, or I know people working on them have have worked more recently to replace master-slave terminology in their projects. Uh, an example. Uh, let's see, at Sandia was the Sierra project, at Livermore, AL3D, and then more recently on the Visit project, we did this. Uh, there's quite a, well, I won't say quite a bit of effort, but there is effort involved in making sure that you replace all the cases uh, where this terminology may be in, occurring. It's important to engage stakeholders early. Um, and of course, you want to ensure you don't introduce any bugs when you make the changes. Um, and there is an article on the Better Scientific Software site about what uh, what the AL3D and Sierra teams went through in, in engaging in this effort. Another one uh, from a colleague here at Livermore Labs, Maria Martinez. Uh, I give her credit for this, avoiding jargon when communicating with newbies. So there's an example statement there uh, to mitigate the DDoS attacks and enhance QoS. IT must configure ACLs and routers and switches, ensure SNMP is secured against unauthorized access and deploy IPSEC VPNs. A uh, lot of jargon in that statement. And the, and the challenge is for newbies that, that, that uh, not, they're not gonna pick up on what all those mean. Uh, they're gonna ask questions that will be meeting interruptions. Um, there will be miscommunication. And so the, the, the upshot is try to avoid jargon or provide a, a, a glossary or someplace people can go to actually, once they hear terms in use, uh, uh, figure out what they mean. And that's actually another a, a tool that Maria Martinez and her team developed at Livermore. There's a place you can go to type in a term you've heard and get its meaning. Uh, gender neutralize your project's documentation. It, so much of the documentation that's out there already tends to be written with a male pronoun. And uh, the, the truth is you can find ways of writing documentation in gender neutral or gender uh, agnostic ways. And, uh, and that's a very useful thing to do. On uh, That's not something I, we've done on the VISIT project yet with the documentation that existed before we adopted this policy, but with documentation that we write uh, when we adopted this policy, I think around 2021, is to not introduce new cases. Hello. Uh, yes. Uh, let's see, another practice, be inclusive in the imagery that you use whenever possible. So uh, on the left there, there's a couple of examples from, uh, from uh, blog articles I wrote for the Better Scientific Software site. And I specifically wanted in the one case where I'm talking about the vision and just some exercises you can do to keep from really straining your eyes when you're doing code development, I specifically asked if we could have a picture of a black man as in 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 that article because we don't often see that in in material that we're uh, we're writing or reading in scientific computing. Uh, the other example is actually uh, something related to the Apollo guidance computer, and I had known that there were black women involved with some of the manufacturing processes in that, but I couldn't find a picture 
uh, of of one. And then I reached out to Raytheon and they actually had a picture that they were willing to let me use. On the left or on the right there, uh, there, there are whole uh, catalogs of inclusive imagery that you can find online. I list some of the uh, links in the middle of the slide here, uh, but inclusive clip art and then just inclusive images in general. And finally, even going reaching out to someone who has an image that you really like, just asking permission, hey, can I use that image over here um, is a way to find uh, uh, inclusive imagery when you need it. Uh, real simple for things like, you know, GUIs and documentations and presentations. You, uh, you notice up there in the uh, in the title UX, I'm using jargon there, I, and, and GUI, UX and GUI jargon. So GUI, graphical user interface, and UX stand uh, user experience. Uh, but there are people dealing with color vision uh, deficiencies. There are tools online that you can actually assess your interface to see how well it's going to look for someone that's uh, that's dealing with color vision deficiency. Uh, the, there's an example there of the uh, the canonical example of someone who's left-handed trying to use a mobile device where the the interface is really designed for right-handed people. Um, there are potentially fonts that are useful for people with dyslexia. There, the, the, I think there's the inv the research is mixed on that, but there are certainly uh, some people that have found uh, have findings that suggest certain fonts may be better for people with dyslexia. Um, so these are ways you can improve your GUIs or documentation and uh, interfaces. So internationalization of interfaces is important. I mentioned this earlier. So this is an example of the visit interface. I think that's running with uh, with French, although now that I'm looking more closely at it, I'm a little troubled why source active is still in English. But open, close, and reopen are all in French. I should look into that. Uh, but that's basically an example of the interface operating in French. The data file that's being displayed there is still from uh, is English. That's why you see like globe.silo. Uh, that would also be pretty useful to do, but much more challenging to modify the data strings that are coming in. Anyhow, um, uh, we were fortunate enough on the visit team to have somebody in Europe that is very interested in maintaining the French inter interface and also has experience with Spanish and German. So that one individual has done that for us. Um, maybe with some of the newer technologies out there, automated translations are better than they used to be. I, I don't honestly know. Um, I've, we've also reached out to UC Davis. I, I live in Davis, California. So we re reached out to the language departments at UC Davis for help in, in doing some translation. We, we're ultimately looking for people to translate our documentation, which that's that's a huge job. Uh, but related to this, use locale whenever possible. So there's this feature of uh, certainly of, of Linux uh, system calls that allow uh, processing of string data. And in particular, whether the comma in a string represents a decimal point or a uh, three digit uh, sort of separator, digit separator. In Europe, typically the comma is representing the decimal point and they'll use spaces for the separator or even dots for the three digit separator. Whereas in the US, it's sort of the reverse of that. Uh, but there are features within the, uh, uh, the str uh, string processing functions of the, uh, the uh, let's, well, I, I guess it's the C, uh, C standard library, C++ standard library that help with this. And um, we're adding this right now. We're in the process of adding features for this to visit so that we can be sure that we process string data correctly that's coming from Europe, for example. Uh, show your pronouns in your profile. So there's a lot of tools that we use on a daily basis. We're using Zoom here in this meeting, but there's things like WebEx Teams, you know, Slack. And, and more recently, a lot of those tools have actually created in your profile the opportunity to specify your pronouns. Uh, if they don't actually have that, you can just in your name, where you enter the name field in your profile, you can add uh, information about your pronouns. Uh, let's see, another thing is to adopt a code of conduct. Uh, there are a number in use. The list that you see there on the right is from a 2017 study of a number of projects on GitHub and how many of those projects were using different codes of conduct. So for example, Contributor Covenant up there is quite a popular one. Uh, but basically what is a code of conduct do does is it basically describes um, how people are expected to behave on the software project and even describes a behavior that is just wholly unacceptable, things like harassment and violence. Uh, a code of conduct includes statements about things that we value, so things like inclusion, safe spaces. 
Uh, and then ultimately how issues are addressed when they're encountered. And again, there are a number of different codes of conduct already written out there. It may make sense to go find one of those and maybe modify it for your project's needs. Another thing that's useful to do is connect with employee research resource groups. So many DOE labs have uh, ERGs. Livermore Labs has um, 10 of them. Um, they're likely to have special expertise that's relevant to pract inclusive practices you may want to roll out in your software, uh, software projects. Honoring special days, so whether or not they're official organization holidays. So often when we're, we're, we're uh, you know, sort of honoring these special days, we'll engage in various activities such as dressing up, uh, sharing slogans and greetings. We maybe decorate or cook special foods, and we just take not time to acknowledge and celebrate these special days. And there's a lot of them for a lot of different groups of people out there. And it turns out different DOE sites may have different official holidays. So... Uh, I learned this uh, talking with David Bernholt recently that the spring holiday at Livermore Labs comes the Monday after Easter. And then there's a holiday at Oak Ridge that's that's kind of somewhat similar to that. It's, it's even called Good Friday at, at Oak Ridge National Labs. So doing finding ways to celebrate or honor these special days, it can be very powerful, but it's also important to be aware of possible appropriation risk when you do this. So uh, just be sure to reach out to leading voices of the relevant communities. That may be an opportunity to engage people in an ERG at your lab. Uh, be cognizant of your collaborator's time zone. So I'm out here on the West Coast, but I, it turns out I have the great fortune of collaborating with people at, you know, at Oak Ridge, at Argonne, at NERSC, also on the West Coast, or Sandia. Uh, various places throughout the country, and uh, and sometimes those people will schedule meetings at like nine in the morning on the East Coast, and it's hard for me. And so when they're asked, when they're looking through trying to determine the times, I always I don't check those times. Those times don't work for me. I'm not a morning person. Uh, that does get very hard as you're, you, the people you're trying to include expand the larger section of the globe. What I've seen, I think, in the SPAC project, I can't recall if this is there's it may not be SPAC, but another project is that. Uh, two different meeting times were adopted at, 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 and they alternate those meetings throughout the, the month, throughout their cycle, so that they can basically grab more people that is uh, over more time zones. Uh, something I really like to do is add inclusive messages to email signature quotes. Um, I really like that one from Albert Einstein, it's harder to crack prejudice than an atom. Um, there's a lot of others there that I often use. I will say, it's, it's very important to really do a lot of research before you try to attribute a, a, a quote to someone because the internet is just full of attribute misinformation with respect to quotes. Um, so yeah, but, but nonetheless, it's still, uh, still useful. Uh, so be present for others in virtual meetings. Um, you know, a lot of people uh, know many of these uh, practices already, but I'll just I'll just call them out again. Having your camera on, you know, of course, muting your mic when you're not speaking. Give speakers feedback and reactions, and try not to multitask. Um, it's really great when you can have backgrounds that commemorate, you know, different themes or topics of the day or uh, what have you. So another another way to be inclusive is pay attention to the onboarding experience. And, and there's for, for new hires at your organization, there's actually two aspects of that experience. There's the sort of institutional onboarding, which is all about becoming an employee at, at that particular organization. Uh, and then there's the part of it that's onboarding that employee to a specific software project. And that, you know, involves a number of things, making sure they get added to all the resources, you know, whether it's the repositories being used at GitHub or, or things being used on Read the Docs, wherever, uh, making sure they have all the right, you know, group, group access and permissions. Uh, if there are coding standards that you're using in your project, making sure that they're aware of those early um, and uh, documents that help people do development, make sure that your, your new uh, newcomers to your project have that information uh, early. And, and even sometimes engaging in some pair programming early on with newcomers if that's something they're receptive to. Uh, another aspect of that is uh, there was a within the last few years, we've had a couple of new team members on the visit project. And for probably the first year, 
Uh, whenever I was asked to review a PR from uh, one of those new members, I, I took I, I made sure I took a lot of time and provided a lot of feedback so that so that they got accustomed to uh, learning, maybe learning aspects about software development that weren't fully documented and uh, and just sort of how things were done. Um, so that's a useful way to be inclusive as well. A lot of us are are developers of of you know scientific computing libraries or full applications and and those applications can have a lot of different test cases and even examples that are that are uh, very interesting. And this is about finding examples that may have a social justice impact, for example, that may resonate with members of underrepresented populations. Um, so finding you know finding these examples and maybe even cultivating and developing them as part of your test suite or example suite. Uh, other examples are things like biases in AI, you know, urban heat islands. Um, in fact, I think some of those examples were the kinds of things that were used last year at the uh, introduction to high performance computing uh, that was uh, rolled out by, I can't remember, and by, well, it was part of the broadening participation program from Sustainable Horizons Institute last year. Um, Let's see, be an active ally in meetings. You know, if you notice a colleague is frequently interrupted in meetings, use your opportunity to speak to circle the conversation back to them, uh, to give them the floor. If you notice some contributors haven't had uh, anything to say, maybe notice this out loud and say, gee, I wonder what uh, Jane or Fred uh, wanted to say about this. Uh, advocate for an inclusive moment exercise in routine meetings. So there's a link there at the bottom of what I'm talking about. It, it's a fairly lengthy uh, a blog article on, on one of the websites uh, related to the work we do. Uh, but basically an inclusive moment is intended to be a relatively short activity uh, that you can include in your, pro your regular project meetings, maybe once every month on the visit project. We do this once every month, uh, maybe more frequently, depending on on what's uh, right for your your particular project. But it's basically calling out a factoid, resource, event, or even experience, uh, and then having some dialogue with the team about it. The goal of keeping it small is so it can be integrated into current you know, regular agendas. And it's basically to raise awareness of inclusion issues and just see deep, deeper thinking. Um, some examples that, that have been used in the past is maybe a quick, quick review of the film Coded Bias. Or imitation game, you know, high, highlighting a pioneering individual or pointing out online inclusive design resources. Those are good examples of an inclusive moment or inclusive minute exercise. Turns out this is practiced in a number of teams and organizations that I see now. Uh, consider joining or following online group uh, groups or hackathons. There's a number of them listed here. Algorithmic Justice League is is very interesting to me. Um, so yeah, uh, there's just this is not a complete list. This is just ones that I found in you know uh, hour of searching online what was available. Uh, something that I've I've uh, done here at Livermore Labs uh, or been part of that someone else has done is participate in a book or movie club, um, at and and basically dealing with topics like the nexus of computing and inclusion. So on the Left there are uh, several books that I've read, and on the right are several movies. And what I what I find just amazing is there is a ton of really interesting, and compelling stories at the nexus of computing and conclusion, uh, computing and inclusion. And so I, I find uh, learning about, uh, for example, the history that that's basically behind a lot of these stories just really interesting. And well, that's partly because I just really uh, enjoy history. Um, and so speaking to that, be curious about history relevant to our community. So, you know, for example, do you all do do we all understand the word computer has referred to a machine only relatively recently in human history? For hundreds of years prior to that, when the word computer was used, it was almost always referring to a woman and all, or I'm sorry, almost always referring to a person and almost always exclusively a woman. Uh, where does the word bug come from? Uh, who likely introduced the term? Likewise for the term software engineering. Uh, these are just some examples I asked myself. What are some of the ways the Manhattan Project manifested inclusive principles? And what are LGUs and how do they impact uh, STEM education? That's a really interesting story, what LGUs are. Maybe we can talk about that when we come to the Q&A. Uh, so, okay, that's uh, that's sort of it for a number of concrete practices. And I'll pause there, David, to see if there were any, any questions.
Yeah, actually, we have a, a couple. So, um, and also a comment. So the first question is information overload is something we all fight constantly. Work can be a sheltering process. Deadlines hamper critical thinking for most people. How do you create room for people to digest and grow forward in their thinking? Well, so for, I can answer that from a personal perspective is eventually I got, there was enough interest of my own in creating the room for myself that I simply prioritized those activities over other things that I was doing. So, you you know, that's right. My day's always full. There's always uh, more to do than there is time to do it in. And for me personally, anyways, what I decided to do was prioritize uh, reading about and engaging with uh, inclusion initiatives um, uh, where before I hadn't. And uh, and so I've just sort of at the end of the day juggled uh, juggled my priorities around a bit. And it is, it is that that has led me to create at least some of the space I have uh, for that. And I will say that as a result of that, my uh, colleagues and, and even uh, uh, some people within management at Livermore Labs at, saw that that's what I was doing and have uh, uh, new doors have opened up for me. So an example is I became a member of the Computing uh, Inclusion, Diversity, Equity, and Accountability Committee. And I don't think that that would have happened if I had not sort of uh, adjusted my priorities and started demonstrating some uh, some uh, experience and interest in that space. So that's not, I don't, I'm sure that's not the answer the uh, person asking wanted to hear, but for me, it was basically just changing priorities. All right, thanks. Um, another one, can you speak to how to resolve circumstances where these guidelines uh, conflict with one another? For instance, what if people have legitimate reasons for leaving their camera off, e.g. bad mental health days, et cetera? Yeah, yeah, so I, you know, I'm perfectly fine at the end of the day with people uh, leaving their camera off for legitimate reasons. Um, and uh, And you're right, like, you know, I, in fact, the camera I'm using today is a brand new one. If 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 we had been meeting a week or two ago, uh, I might have not been able to be on camera because the one I had was just uh, it was going off a cliff. It worked for a few minutes and then it would turn completely white. Uh, white. So yeah, there's a lot of legitimate reasons and and no reason. I mean, there's no reason to mandate. You know, you have to have your camera on. I just I just really encourage it. Um, and it, something else that I encourage is you know. It, it, I've been in meetings where like a, the manager is asking, does anybody have any thoughts on this? And there's dead silence for like five minutes. And I don't know for maybe it's because I'm not I, I'm not I, I'm not really comfortable with long periods of silence. But I always feel I, I want to encourage that manager by saying something like, oh, yeah, I thought about this or or whatever. And so if I if I can't think of something to say, then I'll at least use reactions, a thumbs up or 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 something. Um, I just, uh, I guess I put my myself in other people's feet and sort of, or other people's shoes and sort of ask, okay, what's, you know, what's potentially going on for them? And, uh, and, and the observation is correct. A lot of times various of these ideas can be in conflict with each other and you just have to be uh, flexible and do what, do what makes sense. All right. Um, oops, sorry. Um, a related comment, I disagree with keeping about keeping the camera on. Uh, for example, in the current meeting, most have their cameras off as a cur courtesy to give focus to the speaker. In more intimate meetings, sure, try to have your camera on, but large presentations like this, not as important. Great point. Yeah, great point. I, yeah, there was when I was I was in a meeting recently, there was hundreds of people. It was like an all hands for one of the divisions. And I, I had my camera on and I'm looking across the top and I think the all these tools prioritize the video for people that have their camera on to appear across the top. And I was like, what am I doing up there? And I was, oh, my camera's still on. So real great point. Yeah. All right. Um, and a couple of other things that uh, came from your last slide. Um, so uh, speaking of jargon, what is LGU? LGU, Land Grant University. Or if you if you follow the link that I have there, uh, the indigenous community might refer to that as land grab university, um, but it's 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 a it's an uh, astounding story on legislation that was passed in 1862, 1862, 
and then again in 18, I think 1896, and then uh, and then in the 1980s, three different pieces of legislation. The first one called the Morrill Act, M-O-R-I-L-L, Morrill Act, uh, basically to establish land uh, that states could use to, you know, use the resources, sell it, whatever, to to fund uh, state uh, and state basically state universities and. Most of the STEM degrees that are awarded in the country now, well, most isn't quite the right word. A large portion of STEM degrees come from uh, universities that were started from that legislation in those lands. All right, and one more. Um, how did the Manhattan Project manifest inclusivity? I think I know one community who wasn't a fan. Um, so, uh, uh, so, one uh, one really good example was uh, receptivity of European Jews uh, that were fleeing Europe at the time. Uh, and, and initially, the United States didn't want to bring uh, people in, but we, we changed our, our tone on that. And of course, there were a lot of uh, Jewish scientists from Europe that contributed to the Manhattan Project. The, the project itself, just a real good example, uh, I think they had close to 6,000 people working in Los Alamos at its peak. Uh, there were over 300 babies born during the uh, time that they were there. They had to establish daycare centers. Uh, they had quite a few different varieties of people's uh, tastes in terms of the kind of food that they liked. So they had people cooking different types of cuisine. Um, I could go on, but there was a, a lot of ways in which the Manhattan Trop Project was trying to be inclusive. And, and the anti of that, so... Uh, Germany and the leadership in Germany did not want to rely upon Jewish scientists for anything that they were doing. And so as a result, they uh, were nowhere near as successful as the Manhattan Project was in, in what they were trying to do. All right, thanks. Um, and we have one more, which goes back to the first question asked. Um, so it says, Mark gave his personal approach and motivations for fighting information overload, but I'm curious how to create organizational guides to open others' minds to inclusion. Uh, most people work to do what they want, not just improve for the sake of improvement or participate in uh, distractions. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, I, I think that that's uh, mostly true. And, um, and if you're look so leadership, so for me, a, a sort of a personal experience, but what I have found uh, with my management at Livermore Labs is there are a lot of managers that that cultivate and and point out and are willing to uh, appraise uh, uh, people working in this space. It's included as part, uh, at least in part, with performance appraisals. We just went through performance appraisals for uh, FY24, for example. Um, so there are ways in which the management and and is basically trying to set the culture by saying what their priorities are. They're uh, in meetings, whether it's an all hand from the lab director or even from the uh, uh, computing department head in those meetings, there's usually a slide or two or three talking about inclusion in some in some way. So there's there's a lot of messages where uh, where the at least in in that organization, Livermore Labs, where that's trying to be established, um, and there's still plenty of work to do there because there are plenty who sort of respond. Look, I just want to get my work done. I have this deadline I want to get to, um, but I would say things are slowly changing as a result of some of that uh, pressure from management. All right. I don't see any new questions at the moment. Mark, was there more material you wanted to cover? I don't remember if you had more slides. Uh, there, there really isn't. There's a, the last two slides are really resources. Uh, and, you know, there's, uh, let's, oh, I did, I, yeah, I'll do, just let me speak to this one slide. So uh, I, you know, a minute ago, I was talking about sharing our personal experience about changing, you know, adjusting prioritize, priorities. So the effect of that, I've asked myself, what, what has that manifested in the way that I go about my day and my life? And, and so this slide is about the artifacts of the practice of inclusion, at least from, you know, from my perspective as, as I've gone through these uh, adjustments and priorities. So one is getting comfortable with being uncomfortable. Uh, that's just the nature of the territory, I think. We, and, uh, and, 
And so I've had a lot, a lot more times where I'm maybe a little uncomfortable talking about one thing or another. And, uh, and that, yeah, that's just it. So having regular conversations about things like topics like privilege, race, gender, sexual identity, orientation, uh, never used to do that. That happens pretty regularly. And by regularly, I mean, certainly uh, monthly, maybe more frequently than that. You know, taking trainings and participating in ongoing dialogue with coworkers. Um, that's happening for me, you know, monthly, maybe, you know, biweekly. Uh, reading and keeping up to date with current body of knowledge, just because I've now have a newfound interest in, in material in this space, that happens to, for me weekly. Um, I, I routinely, weekly, have cause to question common assumptions or practices. You know, like, why are we doing it this way? You know, I never used to ask why we're doing it this way. And then, you know, for example, that 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 little device I showed at the beginning, that inclusivity bug with this device that's got a red and green light, it's like, who who came up with this? This this is ridiculous. Most, you know, it seems like a seems like a problem. Um, never would ask that question before. Um, but the other thing I have is when I'm crafting an email, I get to a point where I'm using some turn of phrase that I've always used in the past. And a light will go on and say, why am I using that? Where did that come from? And I'll spend a little bit of time and try to understand, is that a phrase I want to continue using or do I want to adjust my, my language? Uh, how often do I in intentionally interact with others, basically step out my outside my comfort zone? Uh, more often now than I used to. Uh, and how often do you call out microaggressions or speak up for the less privileged? And that's happened for me. Uh, in small ways, somewhat regularly, and there were a couple of really egregious ways that were uh, interesting stories I don't need to get into. So that's the uh, uh, last uh, uh, slide there. And then the other slides are just some resources that maybe have compelling stories and information in them. And I'll, I'll stop sharing there. Great. Thank you. I uh, I don't see any new questions in the document. Um, I think this is the stage where we can open it up uh, to a little bit more interactive uh, question and answer, and or we can um, consider if Mark wants to run his Kahoot game, if people are interested in that. So feel free to raise your hand if you have a question and, and can unmute to ask it or if you um would you like to play cahoots let's we you can show a thumbs up maybe to to show that uh looks like suzanne has a question to start so it's a question for mark and for everybody to think about how do we know if our inclusive practices are being effective how do we measure that informally and maybe formally too Yeah, great question. Metrics. Somebody, somebody's got to ask about metrics. Um, and uh, yeah, I have, I do not have any any good answers to that uh, yet. Other than that, that last slide that I shared. I mean, that's in some sense, those are anecdotal metrics for what it has meant for me individually and personally. Personally. Anybody else have thoughts on on this? Okay, great, great um, question, Suzanne. Yeah, comments on that or other questions people might want to raise? Looks like somebody in the document might be looking around for a place to type a question. Uh, feel free to go ahead and, um, oh yeah. Um, uh, unmute and ask your question if you want, and we'll try to capture it as we go. I'm while they're while they're typing. I'm I'm looking in the chat there, and I see. Speaking of jargon, what is LGU? So so actually, that, that I used LGU intentionally in the hopes that someone might ask, "What is an LGU?" <laughs> All right, and folks should please remember that the slides have um, all the links actually underlying those resources and things that uh, Mark mentioned. So, uh, and I did put, I can put it again in the chat, but the slides are already available online. And uh, of course, we'll, we'll link you when everything gets um, 
posted after we get the archives up. You know, David, I, I wonder if I could ask a, a real quick question of the group, if anybody has. So, so during this hour, were there any things that occurred to anybody that that uh, there there were some things already shared, things like you know maybe uh, you know thinking about that the policy of having camera on, you know, small meetings versus large meetings and this this question of metrics. But how about, you know, did anything, any other sort of concrete practices occur to people that, well, why, why, why isn't he talking about that? Or maybe this is something to add to the list. Okay, well, I'll say this. If anyone who, who attended today does think of something in the next week or two and say, you know what, you really ought to speak to this or whatever, please feel free to uh, send me an email. I'm just going to put my email in the chat here. And uh, yeah, happy to, happy to include uh, new stuff when, when I find it. Actually, just today, I saw a comment about um, hemispheric bias, uh, especially, you know, using um, seasonal related terminology and greetings with people in the opposite hemisphere um, doesn't match up for example yeah great example we have a we have a training we do at livermore called the moments that matter training and and i've been tra i've been trained to give that training and at some point so we go through the slides and we talk about uh, we talk about behaviors that we're trying to uh, reduce and behaviors we're trying to increase and and part of the analogy of that is what we call true north. This is the north that we want to get to. And someone observed, well, you know, if you're in the south, that may not be the direction you want to go. <laughs> right. So, yeah, great, great observation. Absolutely. So we've had a couple more questions come in. Um, how can we make these practices survive shifting political slash cultural winds? A lot of us are feds and we know that the changes in administrations can have huge impacts on what we're allowed to do and how we're allowed to act. Um, that's way outside my pay grade. Um, <laughs> uh, and there may be here people here who can speak to that, but I, I definitely agree that's a, that's a very, very interesting uh, uh, question. Yeah. Um, and another one, which is still being formulated, so I'll go back to the chat for a moment and notice that in response to the earlier question about how we measure um, the uh, result of trying to use inclusive practices, uh, we have one suggestion, maybe you would notice turnover going down over the years. Um, and we had somebody saying, uh, that they conduct a climate survey every few years to gather this sort of data administered by a third party organization to lessen the bias. Um, yeah, so a couple of comments on that front. Let's see. Uh, yeah, thanks for one. mentioning that. I see that now. That's from Sarah. And yeah, and that it turns out. I, I, you know, I maybe should know this. I'm not sure if Sarah is from uh, Livermore as well, but that that is that exact practice that Sarah describes is something that we do at Livermore. We've been doing, I think, for the last maybe five or six years. You do it every year, or no, no, no. The, the the so the broad sort of entire Livermore workforce, I think, is surveyed every three years. And it's it, my recollection was that survey took more than an hour to fill out. I mean, it was more than as oh, like wow. 120 questions. Yeah, that's a lot to ask. Yeah, yeah. Do they give you a charge code for that? Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, you know what? I don't know. They may be going forward. They will, but I don't recall that in the past. No, that was sort of a tax on all the projects at the lab. Yeah, interesting. So there's a, another comment in chat. Um, many people believe that a lack of attention to inclusivity in our environments is why we have a lack of diversity and underrepresentation. So that could be another metric. If intentional focus is a goal, does it change? Yeah, yeah, great point. Uh, and we're seeing, let's see, there's a little bit more in chat. Um, not sure if this is, uh, completely good or not, but uh, have language or initiatives that's politically neutral. Oh, I think this is uh, this is a, a response from somebody on the call to the question about how do we survive the shifting political winds. Um, 
So not sure if this is completely good, but we have uh, language for initiatives that's politically neutral. The risk here is that you're not calling out um, the need directly. Things like, you know, DEIA turning into inclusive workforce development and retention. And so it's less, uh, less of a direct statement about what you're trying to accomplish. Yeah, that, I mean, even the words diversity versus inclusion, I, my my experience with those words over the last, say, you know, eight years is that diversity has comes with more baggage at the end of the day than inclusion does. And it's probably why we hear inclusion more often than we hear diversity. And one more question. I'm attending SC24 this year to try to get more involved with Exascale software but there doesn't seem to be a focus to use this moment to include others or really address inclusion. Women have their groups uh, at this event, but the industry needs to use these events to define requirements to speed inclusion. That, that's a very interesting observation. The, the, so I was loosely, and I see very loosely involved with the inclusion committee for SC23. And there was a lot going on there um, for SC23. And I, I assume because of that, uh, the people who picked up SC24 were carrying uh, the ball forward with, with that. But if not, then I could suggest maybe some people uh, that that individual could reach out to, to kind of either get find the resources that are there or to identify people that should be encouraged to help develop those resources. I also wanted to ask the person who posed that question, um, is how much of the kind of inclusion you're talking about is um, including people who don't have prior experience with HPC or Exascale software and things like that into this particular community and how much of it is other forms of inclusion, many of which uh, Mark has referred to in earlier in the talk. I'm gonna come off of audio. I think mm -hmm. mainly I would like to see them define the Exascale requirements and I think that will drive the inclusion the, the event really is people who are already in HPC. They have history, they have connections, they have education, but to include others, it, you know, I think they need to advertise more about what skills development is needed to move into that. I think Suzanne has a comment on that. No, I agree completely with you, and I'd love to hear your ideas. I work on the committees that are generally aimed at students that are at that very beginning level where we're trying to convince students that HPC is worthwhile. There's also one named high school teachers, so they can go back and convince their students that HPC is worthwhile. But it'd be interesting to think of ways to that, that we can brainstorm on ways to involve people that are not uh, using HPC or advanced computing. Uh, is, is that sort of what you're getting at? Yes. yes. So yeah, I'll, I'll, thanks, Suzanne. And thanks, George, for the, the um, comment there. It's, um, I'll add to that, that I do, I agree, my experience, I've been in the HPC community my entire career, but I've also had occasions to, to, um, step outside that a little bit, uh, giving tutorials and things like that. And um, and we have been called out for being too HPC biased in some of the tutorial materials we give and things like that. And um, so I, I, there is there is a bias there um, that we might not be sensitive to, um, to include other people into this particular community. I do wanna note also that SC in particular, there are often sort of uh, intro to HPC kind of tutorials that are available if you're uh, willing to pay for the tutorial program, which is not inexpensive, but but that's another way that can help onboard people into this community to some extent. And there's other, you know, courseware like that that's available outside of SC as well. But but George, I agree, it's a, it's a community that is not always aware that not everybody um, knows what HPC really means and what's entailed there. Yeah, the other, you know, just, just to make some comments on that, when I went through and registered and examined the program this year, many of the programs for like the tutorials and these other programs, they're like whole days. So like digital twins would be a whole day mm -hmm. or storage would be a whole day. I think that is too much probably for someone that 
looking to break into the field. I think probably lightning talks, maybe half day, two or three hours would be okay. But just, I think a turnoff will be a whole day. <laughs> mm -hmm. On the other hand, there are um, many who are interested in the deeper dives who, who are also part of this community. So um, yeah, there's probably more needs there than are being met. It's my personal opinion. No, no, no. I mean, I get it, right? I mean, if, you're, if you've been doing this for 20, 30 years, right, you want to come down there and get deep dives, and, I, and I'm not against that. But if you want more inclusion, right, you're going to have to, you know, people, they have to walk before they can run, right? They're not going to not gonna come in and be ready to just work for 12-hour days, right? Yeah. You know, hearing hearing the, uh, the the conversation about this, the one thing that that occurred to me is how much HPC software development gets done on a laptop. I mean, it's it's astounding and it's amazing because the these codes that run to massive scale on you know bazillions of GPUs and and everything, a lot of them get developed. Um, Ninety nine point nine nine percent of the code gets developed on a laptop, and and that is amazing to me. And it's not something I don't think that that. Uh, like when I, I have HPC, I have interns that work in HPC and I tell them, well, probably most of the work you're going to do this summer, you can get done on a, lamp, a laptop and they're kind of stunned by that. Um, so, yeah, you only need to you turn, dial that knob to maximum scale when you're really running that main main science run. I mean, just to, you know, just to reply to that, I personally just rent hours on Azure. They have a Cray Exascale machine in their service. So I just rent hours when I need to do real work or get heavy experience, but my solution has been to just go straight to HPE and attend their training. But I was hoping that the industry might do better and provide those opportunities. Great point. Thanks for mentioning that, George. And I do note that we have passed the top of the hour. We've uh, lost a fair number of people, but there's still some hanging on. So we can keep chatting if there's interest, but I think we also need to acknowledge that it's about time to wrap things up. Well, thank, thank you, David, for the opportunity, and thanks, everyone, who, uh, who came and engaged. I, I really appreciate that. Thank you, Mark, for a great talk, and thanks, everybody who attended. We'll get the um, archives up very soon and let you all know about that. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.